What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to the channel. So in the last couple of videos, I talked about setting the resolution on the EOS R5 and R5C and how the camera gets from point A of what the sensor actually is recording to point B of what the sensor is actually putting in the file or what the camera is actually putting in the file. What I didn't talk about in those two videos was kind of the thought process that should go into or could go into picking the resolution to shoot at or deliver in. So that's what I want to talk about in this video, because in a lot of respects, it doesn't really matter what camera you're shooting with. The choice of resolution, unless there's some major deficiency, is going to be kind of general. So I want to start by, well, at least for me at least, when it comes to these kinds of uh, topics, I like to start at first principles. If I can understand what it is that I actually need, as opposed to what, say, marketers have told me that I need, or marketers have t sold as the thing everybody needs because we need to sell a new camera or TV, then I can make informed decisions about what I'm doing, and I can figure out how to plan and budget for whatever situation that may come up as a result of that. So space constraints or things like that. So when push comes to shove, the resolution that you need is not an unbounded problem. So you have to, for me at least, I have to establish the, the first principle position of like, where are we actually starting from? So my target audience for anything that I'm creating is people and people in now and in the near future, which ultimately means that the limiting boundary condition that I have to deal with when it comes to all of the content that I'm producing is the human eye. I'm, you, we are all watching this video on some kind of display, uh, but fundamentally what it is that is bringing that information into our head is our eyes. So that's a good place to start when talking about the whole resolution uh, requirements thing. So I have the standard that I apply essentially for my minimums when it comes to talking about resolution. And this really applies sort of across the board and that's normal vision. Some people call it perfect vision, uh, but the truth is, is that people have better than perfect vision. So that it's not quite perfect then, is it? In the US, we would call this 2020 vision. In Europe, you would call it, I believe, 66 vision, but it's the same thing. It's if a normal person can see the thing at six meters or 20 feet, then the per and you can see it at six meters or 20 feet, then it's the same thing or that you have that level of vision. When you start digging into what this means, it means that you can differentiate two items that are one arc minute apart. So an arc minute is a 60th of a degree. So if we translate this into pixels, because pixels are a uniform spaced uh, grid, then we're talking a pixel pitch or a pixel size where each pixel is 1 60th of a degree. So your eye is seeing a 2020 vision, your eye is able to resolve one pix or 60 pixels per degree. But of course, that's, as I just said, that's not perfect. That's not the upper limit. That is a normal visual level that people are talking about or that people are working with or what most people you could expect to, to approach. So fortunately, scientists and doctors have done a whole bunch of research into human vision because it's an interesting topic for scientific study. And they have measured using laser interferometry and all kinds of cool scientific stuff that I don't really want anything to deal with. Uh, the, the best possible case that people have, they've measured for human vision is around 28 arc seconds. We'll round it to 30 arc seconds. So an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute or a 3600th of a degree. 30 arc seconds is half an arc minute. Pretty easy. So translating this into pixels per degree again, we come up with 128 pixels or about 128 pixels per degree for 28 arc seconds, or you could really easily just round it to 120 pixels a degree, say half an arc minute. So it's basically twice the resolution of your standard 2020 vision. There's one other absolute limit when it comes to talking about this that I do want to talk about, and that is diffraction. So 
Diffraction is a property of light. It is the due to the wave nature of light when it travels through a small opening or a uh, whether it's a you know aperture in a lens or the pupil in your eye or whatever, it spreads out. It causes the light to spread out, like kind of like the waves going around a pier or when you drop something in water and the waves ripple out. Uh, light does the same thing. Diffraction is not something that you can circumvent. Yes, in cameras we have computational photography stuff that now can do additional sharpening and deconvolution, knowing the exact diffraction behavior of a given lens and all of that stuff. But that's not what's happening in our brains and that's not what our eyes are doing. So there's no, no circumventing of diffraction when it comes to this. Turns out that due to the, based on the size of the pupil, in the best case scenario, your diffraction limited uh, at a 24, or when you resolved something down to 24 arc seconds, not all that far away from the maximum possible that's been measured in laboratory status with actual people. Uh, this works out to about 150 pixels per degree. So what does all of this mean when you're talking about it in the context of this question of how much resolution is enough resolution for video? Well, 2020 sets a good target, in my opinion. It shouldn't look bad to people looking at it. It should certainly be far enough away from not looking good enough or not being sharp enough that the quality of the video won't detract from the story or the, the broader creative context of what you're doing. So it's a good number to shoot for, but obviously you can go higher. I don't think you could even go lower and that's worked perfectly fine for a long time. We've not had high enough resolution displays or high enough resolution projection in theaters to actually make things that good, which is a great point of, of sort of reinforcing a point that I'm going to come to in a minute. Uh, so that's what you, I, what I at least ideally want to at minimum hit. If I can get there or get very close to there, I'm happy. On the other hand, we have the maximum possibles and the absolute limits. And it's very easy to take on this, this idea that that is where you should be targeting. Um, and it's certainly reasonable to sort of target that as, I mean, granted, if you can shoot with enough resolution and deliver with enough resolution that you're hitting these maximum possible or absolute diffraction limited limits of vision, uh, things are going to be the best that they possibly can be. The caution here, at least, that I would make is going beyond this. Uh, it's very tempting with the marketing for cameras and TVs and all of this kind of stuff to believe that resolution or vision or any of these kinds of things are open-ended situations or open-ended questions and that we can keep putting more and more and more in front of us and we will be able to make use of it. And the reality is, is that's not the case. Once you satisfy 150 pixels per degree, the diffraction limited resolution of your eye, putting more information there is not going to be visible to you. It's just going to be lost. So that's kind of the easy part of the easy part of this discussion. Things get considerably harder when we actually start talking about or taking into account what vision is. So our eyes don't work like a camera. Our eyes and brain, our visual processing, it, for starters, we don't have a regular grid of photo detectors in our eyes. Uh, like your camera does, where the pixel pitch is the same everywhere on the sensor, or a TV, the pixels are the same everywhere on the TV. That's not how our eyes are built. On top of that, as a and as a consequence of a whole lot of things, we don't really see in terms or like a camera does, where it's collecting light uniformly and generating an image. There is a whole lot of processing being done by our brain on the visual signal that we are it is getting to remove things to add things to polish things over and and so forth so we just talked about the maximum resolving power of the eye 
And this, these numbers that I came up with, the 60, 128, and 150 pixels per degree, are for a part of the eye that is our central vision. It's called your foveal vision, and it's called that because there's a structure in the back of your eye in the center, visual center of the eye, called the fovea. And this is where the highest level of photosensitive cells are in our eyes. And these big numbers that we talk about, or relatively big numbers, like 60 or 150 pixels per degree, apply there. But this is an incredibly tiny area uh, of our actual visual cone. Uh, our peripheral vision out you know, here is nowhere near that good. In fact, once you get about 10 degrees away from the center of your visual cone, so the center of your fovea, you have lost about 80% of your visual acuity. So that 60 pixels per degree for 2020 vision is down to only 12 pixels per degree. And that 150 pixels per degree for uh, your diffraction limited aperture uh, or diffraction limit on your eye is down to only 30 pixels per degree. So even if you could see at the diffraction limit, 10 degrees off axis and you're down to only 30 pixels per degree. Now, the reason I bring this up, and this goes with the discussion on all of the processing that goes into vision, is that we don't, and part of the reason I said we don't see the world like a camera does, is that we don't see the whole picture at the same resolution, the whole world around us at the same resolution. Instead, our brains are working like the ultimate real-time Photoshop panorama stitching system. Our brain drives our eyes to move around because it's only got a hot, lot of information from a very narrow angular area in our vision, drives our eyes to look around the picture and hone in on things that are, it determines or believes or has evolved to see as being relevant. So this is things like bright spots or faces. Faces are very important. This is also things like um, why leading lines and color are in all of the general sort of, sort of photographic compositional things work because they're targeting or triggering our brain to move our eyes through a image in a certain way to arrive at a point. And this is also why in things like if you're doing wildlife photography or portraiture or whatever, like bright spots in the background are very distracting because your brain keeps trying to look at the bright spot because that could be be an area in a, a gap in the bushes where there's a thing trying to eat you, or at least would have been the case or could have been the case, you know, thousands of years ago when there were not cameras, but there were things in the bushes trying to eat you. The consequence of all of this is the bigger the image in your field of view, the more your eye has to move in full range to be able to scan the whole image. Now, it's not necessarily true that it's going to do that in every image, uh, but it is certainly something that it's going to have to do based on the angle of view. And this, of course, can lead to eye strain. So if you ever look all the way up, down, left, or right, or all the way to any extreme, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. And the same is true if your eye is having to repeatedly do this to watch a movie or look at a picture. Vision is also com more complicated still because I said the brain is doing a whole lot of processing to deal with other factors. So not only is there a cone of very narrow, sharp vision, but we also have blind spots in our eyes. Everybody has them. It's where the optic nerve lands on the eye and where that happens, there are no photoreceptive cells on the other side. So you have one blind spot in each eye. Now, you'll probably have noticed that when you walk around in day-to-day -day life, you don't see big dark spots out in the world, you know, in your vision where your brain isn't receiving any photographic or any light information from your eye. Uh, 
The reason that happens or isn't the case is because your brain is filling in what is or should be in where the blind spot is based on what your other eye sees and based on context from surrounding it. And it's a very complicated perceptual uh, situation. The same thing happens with that high resolution information and the fact that we have a uh, short term memory and that's part of our uh, perception and visual processing. And so your brain will actually persist to a certain extent, some information from the high detailed passes into the lower detail areas that it's now your eye is now as it's moved away, it's now covered. So the short of it is, is human vision is really complicated and it's not quite, it's not nearly as simple or straightforward to talk about or to quantify as it is to say, measure the resolving power of a camera sensor or build a camera sensor that resolves at a certain resolution. Now, you'll notice that in this whole discussion so far, we've been talking about resolution angularly. And this is the way you normally would talk about resolution in an optical sense, uh, because that's how, they, how lenses work. And you'd be intimately familiar with this if you consider for the moment that when you look at grass that's at your feet, you can actually see blades of grass and detail in the blades of grass. But if you look at grass that's in a lawn a half a mile away or a quarter mile away, that it, it's just green. You can't see individual blades of grass. If our vision somehow worked as a linear resolution instead of an angular resolution, then you would see just as much detail in the blades of grass at some distance than you would at, or as you would at your feet. But lenses and camera or cameras and TVs and screens and display devices, they all use linear resolution, pixels per inch, not pixels per degree. So we have to be able to convert from pixels per degree, the angular resolving power of our eye to pixels per inch to understand what the resolution of a screen has to be. Now, there's, this is where things get complicated in a lot of respects because we're no longer talking about something that's easily measurable. We are now talking about a situation where different factors can influence things. Fortunately, I don't have to reason through all of this in this video. I simply have to stand on the shoulders of the giants who have done this before me. So the first, there's a couple of standards that consistently come up when it comes to talking about camera or screen size with respect to cinematography or projection, home theaters, that kind of thing. The first one comes from the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, or SIMPTI, as I'm apparently uh, been discovered that they call themselves or they pronounce their acronym as opposed to spelling it out. Uh, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, the society, SIMPTI says, or wrote a standard back in the mid nineties that said that the minimum distance that a viewer should be from a theater screen is the distance where the screen covers a 30 degree angle of view in the person's visual cone. Uh, you'll notice that most of these dis uh, discussions, they use angular measures too, because it allows it's basically in line with the angular resolution of the eye. In any event, this standard is EG-18-1994, and you will find this cited all over the place on the internet for discussions on this kind of thing. What almost never is also included in that discussion is that SIMPTI has withdrawn this standard from publication. They withdrew it in March of 2003, and they said that it was not reflective of modern projectors and theater technology where higher resolutions would allow people to sit closer and be more and not have the impact of low resolution or low quality. They would be able to sit closer and have a more immersive experience. The other standard that gets talked about an awful lot with this is the standards that THX applies when THX is certifying a theater. Like the SIMPTI standard, I don't have exact 
Like I've never actually read this standard largely because it is not publicly available. However, there's many sources on the internet that cite these numbers. They're consistent about it and it's internally consistent with publicly available information from THX. So I'm gonna run with these numbers and attribute them to THX uh, certifications. So THX says that the maximum distance so in the SMPT standard, they said the minimum distance, which is basically the front row in a theater, the THX standard says the maximum distance that a person should be from the screen is when the screen covers 26 degrees of their uh, field of view. And that they recommend that the seating distance be at 36 degrees. So that would be the optimal distance by their, their standard. Now, this is, as I said, consistent with other published information from THX. So THX on their website at thx.com slash question slash what size TV should I buy for my living room? Uh, I take a little bit of a, a dispute with the title of this because, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. That article says that the screen size of the TV that you put in your living room should be equal to the distance that you sit from the TV times 0.835. So if you plug some numbers in and you say that you have a 144 inch or 12 foot seating distance and you multiply that by 0.835, you end up with a recommendation of a 120 inch TV. Now, this is why I said that I don't think the THX standard should be what should I buy for my living room, but what should I buy for my home theater room? Because quite honestly, I sit about that far from the TV in my living room, and while I could imagine having a 120-inch TV in a home theater, in a living room that's not just intended to be dominated by a massive TV for watching movies, uh, it uh, is a bit big. However, if you do the math on this, that works out to be about 36 degrees, covering about 36 degrees of your angle uh, or your field of view. Now, THX does note in this article that 4K TVs would allow you to go bigger. They don't tell you how much bigger. The number that often I see thrown around on the internet is 40 degrees of angle of view as opposed to 36 degrees of angle of view, which is a, you know, reasonable size up. Uh, so that's what I'm going with here, but there is no, as far as I've seen, official sort of standard on where uh, what that larger number should be in any event the situation with optimizing viewing distance is basically it's balancing the trade-off of eye strain from the picture being too small and therefore either being glary or just hard to discern because it's too small and immersiveness from the picture being very big and therefore filling most of your field of view and eye strain on the flip side, the picture is so big that you have to move your eyes too much to be able to uh, comfortably sit and watch of it. And ultimately that number looks like it falls somewhere between 26 and 40 degrees, give or take for cinematic op applications. Now, I should point out that like almost everything in photography, these are fuzzy numbers or what I call fuzzy numbers. They're not hard and fast rules. Uh, they can be slightly different. So that's what makes this challenging sort of to talk about. But this also raises a big question in that SMPT and THX standards are talking about theater screens or home theater screens. Does that apply everywhere? So phones, computers, tablets, that kind of thing. Do we still use those in the same visual ranges or does something change with that? So I sat down, looked at basically all of the devices that I have and did some math to figure out what the uh, viewing distance or in terms of angle of view would be or the viewing distance for an angle of view would be for everything from a 5.7 inch phone to a 65 inch TV and at 26, 36 and 40 degrees. And then I, because I picked devices that I have, I then went and looked at how I fare on all of this. Well, by and large, I generally fall in the 26 to 36 degree range with pretty much every device I own. There are being some, or there are some exceptions to that. So my iPhone 
26 degrees would be holding it 11 inches from my face. 40 degrees would be holding it 7 inches from my face. This is one place where I feel like these standards really fall apart, largely because at that close of a distance, I find that I have a tremendous amount of eye strain simply because I'm trying to focus way too close to me and that's not comfortable for me to do. So I tend to hold my phone further away than what would be 26 degrees of my angle of view. Uh, my laptop, I was very interested to see that sits right at 26 degrees when I'm using it in general use, the way I sit in relation to the screen, it's just, it's basically spot on. One place that I found interesting, uh, again, was my desktop. Uh, so I have 27 inch monitors on my desktop. And this is where I think, again, some context of all of this has to be taken in. When I'm working on my computer, my monitor fills more than 40 degrees of my field of view. I sit closer to the, than the 32 inches that would be recommended for a 27 inch display. However, when I'm watching content, I sit much closer to 26, in, uh, 26 degrees, which is about 51 inches from the screen. I sit somewhere around 40, 44, something in that, because I'm leaning back and watching content. So that's something I think to keep in mind and where these numbers can break down a little bit. Uh, likewise, our TV in the living room, it's 11 and a half feet away. So that's 130 ish, inch, 130 inches or almost 130 inches. Uh, more than 130 inches, I'm sorry. So it was 140 inches that uh, 26 degrees would be 123 inches. I could sit, certainly see sitting closer to it, but in general use, I don't find that to be that big of a problem. So the short of what I'm getting at here is based on, at least on my own testing, looking at friends and families, houses, and like how they use things and stuff like that, viewing distances for cinematic content seems to really fall within that 26 to 40-ish degree range that uh, these standards have uh, put out. So since we're talking about standards that are talking about coverage of your field of view and degrees, and we have visual resolution of the eyes and pixel de per degree, it's a real simple matter to multiply the two together and figure out what you actually need for any given situation. So I have done that here. I will put a graph up to show or a chart up to show the values. Uh, but surprisingly, the numbers are not really insane. Uh, for 36 degree angle of view, you're talking at 2020 vision, you're talking about 12 and a half percent more resolution than 1080p. That's not a lot. I mean, it's nothing, not nothing, but it's not a lot. And that translates to about 20% higher resolution than 4K UHD. Uh, at, uh, so it's 2160 pixels in image width for 2020 vision and 4608 pixels in image width for uh, basically satisfying the theoretical limits of visual acuity. So we're talking, you know, when everybody's out pushing, all these TV manufacturers are out pushing this whole thing of like, oh, you know, you need an 8K TV and, and so on and so forth. We're not talking that that's absolutely all that necessary. I mean, you can make it necessary. You could certainly get to situations where that is, but, but in a lot of cases, it's beyond the visual limits of human visual acuity. Now, I said that I kind of target 1080p. Uh, it's close enough that I don't really see it being an issue. And that brings me to the second thing I want to talk about in this video, which is the mitigating factors that why you don't necessarily need to have as much resolution as these numbers absolutely seem to indicate. And ultimately, this comes down to perception and it comes down to the difference between still imagery and video and why, you know, like how things work out. So let's talk through this. Let's start with talking about what a picture is and sort of the a priori requirements behind uh, the thought process of a picture. So a picture is a the three-dimensional world flattened into a two-dimensional image as seen through the camera's lens. So it's distorted in some ways, not that that's a big uh, 
factor, but it is distorted from being three-dimensional into being two-dimensional. It's also a moment in time that's frozen. Now, when I say a moment in time, I'm not saying that it has to be a uh, thousandth of a second or an eight thousandth of a second or something like that. Uh, the moment in time could be hours long, but it is fixed into an image that, however long that exposure was, it is fixed into an image in perpetuity that it doesn't change. This has some consequences on the visual side or the, the viewing side of things. So, for instance, there is no meaningful limit on how long you can study a picture. Okay, maybe the security throws you out of the gallery or the museum because they're closing, uh, but you certainly didn't have to study if the exposure was taken in, in an eight thousandth of a second. You certainly don't have to study that picture in only an eight thousandth of a second. Uh, second of all, sort of, I guess, do inherently to the way that the goal of photography is we have somewhat different priorities between stills and video. So when you're talking about stills, sharpness and detail are often of paramount importance. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't people who do creative things with soft lenses or soft focus or that you don't have motion blur in creative applications. But by and large, the photograph photographic community, the camera and lens buying uh, public, isn't coming out and saying we want crappier lenses there or and lower resolution cameras. They're saying we want sharper lenses. And ultimately, even when I'm shooting, my objectives, by and large, are to freeze action and make sharp, crisp images. An image of a bird in flight is not as good if that blur bird is blurry as if it is where you can see every feather and the whites of its eyes, so to speak. So, that's a little bit different in terms of priorities from video. So let's talk about video. What is the difference between video and stills? Well, first of all is time. Video is, of course, an illusion. Sometimes we forget that, I think, in the fact that it's so prevalent at this point in time. Uh, but video is, is the illusion or shows, provides the illusion of motion by showing sequential images taken in time rapidly at a frame rate and composed or blurred is, I guess, without not giving away the farm, in such a way that it makes our brain think that we're seeing something happen in smooth motion. Of course, in reality, you're getting discrete steps in your video. So, thing here, next frame, thing here. There's no transition between the two frames. It is frame one, frame two, and, and that's it. There's some other consequences to this, though, of course, because we're talking about images in sequence in time. Each image is only displayed for, at best, just under 42 milliseconds. That's 24 frames per second, Obviously, if you shoot at a higher or you display at a higher frame rate, 30, 60, whatever, then you have even less time for each individual image. Now, I know somebody will probably say, yes, but I can hit pause and I can study the image. But at that point, you're no longer watching a video. You're studying a still. And it's not really the same thing. The other thing is, is that because this is an illusion, motion blur is a requirement in the context of video in order to fool our brains into thinking that it is watching smooth, natural content. We see with motion blur, wave your hand in front of your face and without tracking it with your eyes, you will not see a sharp hand, you will see a blur. If that blur is not built into the video that's being rep replayed for you, then it does not look quite right. In some limited extents, it can look punchier in some the words of some cinematographers because it's sharper than it should be and so it adds a little bit of like punch to the image. 
in extreme cases, say very high shutter speeds, like a thousandth or two thousandth of a second at very low frame rates, say 24 frames per second or 25 frames per second, it can look stuttery or unnatural because the images are so sharp and they're coming so slowly that you actually are really feeling you you don't have the blur to mask the fact that you're actually just seeing a sequence of static images so that's one aspect but video is more complicated than that because it's not just picture in time there's added layers to the video presentation in terms of, say, for example, sound. And this brings me back to my point earlier about not seeing the world the way a camera does, but perceiving it in a much more complicated way. So the sound, the audio, the soundtrack, whether it's music or somebody talking, influences our perception in of what's going on and what's important in that video. So, for example, in my videos here, most of them are, well, there's not a whole lot of need to talk about the, the video isn't the major selling point, the audio track is. Like, I can very easily just put still pictures up over these videos and talk and 90% or more, actually more than 90% of the discussion would be conveyed. The pictures would probably end up being distract, distracting though, and the audio would certainly probably distract from the pictures. Uh, likewise, you can see this if you watch something like a horror movie, if you hit mute, it's not as scary. If you put comedy music over it, then it's not horror anymore at all. This is compounded again, fold through perception in that almost all video content has some form of narrative or story associated with it as well. And this is going to prime your brain to focus on certain factors and it is going to prime, it is going to influence your perception of what's important as a whole. If everything that you're doing in your story, in your video, whether it's whatever it is, is compelling, people will not be able to even see huge issues in quality. So to kind of summarize this, some resolution is straight up not actually even there. It's lost in motion blur and depth of field, but primarily motion blur. Motion blur is not resolution or is resolution agnostic. If something moves across the screen for a given exposure and a given frame rate, the blur will be the same size in angle of the screen covered or percentage of the screen covered regardless of how much resolution you're shooting at. At 4K it will be more pixels, at 8K it will be even more pixels, but the blur doesn't get sharper. Anything that's blurred doesn't get sharper because you're shooting at a higher resolution. The other side of the whole thing is perception, and it's not really that resolution is lost there, it's that the need for that resolution is not really necessary. Our brains are focusing on things in the video far more important than how good the quality looks like. Now the last part here is the real billion dollar question maybe. Biggest takeaway is is that as much as we've talked about resolution being certain numbers based on standard vision or the limits of visual acuity, the Reality is, is, as I've said, those numbers are fuzzy. And if your content is compelling, it will mask lack of resolution. Resolution will be masked by motion blur that just is inherent if you're moving the camera or your subject's moving. And ultimately, you know, a big part of this question comes down to what's an acceptable or what's the actual viewing distance that people are going to be watching your content at. So this has all been a very long-winded first principles look to, or discussion to get to the question of how much resolution is enough resolution and what should you target? Simple answer, 4K. It's a safe place. Uh, it, it's not un onerous or unreasonable to work with. So it exceeds the normal visual limits that we talked about earlier across the board with a pretty good margin in basically all cases.
it exceeds the theoretical maximum for at least resolute or viewing angles where the monitor is less than 36 degrees of your angle of view. Of course, hitting those numbers exactly, as I said, is probably not that important. So it's probably not going to make that much of a difference, even if it slightly doesn't, you know, it's 20% lower, the, you know, versus, you know, 4K versus 4.3K, essentially. This has some advantages, at least on the production side of things. So on the display side of things, it means you're pretty well set. On the production side of things, it means that you have some margin. If you're shooting in 4K, you have the margin to crop and recompose in uh, without undershooting your normal visual limits or visual requirements. And the reality is, is that like any production, we're talking about balancing, you know, in, in anything in life, we're always talking about balancing things. 4K is four times bigger than, requires bit rates four times higher than, or around four times higher than 1080p or 2K, uh, but that still ends up being relatively reasonable, at least for most people. Now, this gets more complicated. We'll talk about a lot this a lot more in bit rates and frame rates and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's broadly more accessible with the cost of storage now. 4K is broadly more accessible to more people. That said, 2K or 1080p can't strictly be ruled out. In any event, 2K doesn't quite cover 36 degrees when the screen covers 36 degrees at 2020 vision or any of the theoretical maximum limitations of vision. As I said, I don't think this is that big of a deal because in most cases, that's not the focus. You know, it's not, you're not looking at a still, you're looking at movie and if the content is good enough, it really does. If the content has some catch, something to involve the audience, it's not, the, the visual quality is not purely as important. Now, that said, the biggest limitation that I find shooting here with 1080p is, of course, on the production side, you don't have a lot of margin. I have to compose my shots the way I want my shots to be. I don't have a lot of room to do any kind of pushing or post, um, recomposition in post-production. Additionally, you do run into problems with online streaming services. So for example, if you look at the bit rates that YouTube uses, the 4K content actually gets a higher proportional bit rate than 1080p does. So their, their recommended upload bit rates, for example, for 1080p 30 is eight megabits and for 4K 30 is 35 to 45 megabits. So if you're at the higher end of that 45 megabits, the content isn't going or is going to be better looking than if you're, if you're at the eight megabit for 1080p. Additionally, you, you know, when you get to higher and higher resolutions, the pixel, pixels themselves matter of less. So, you know, it almost should be the other way around in some respects. The 1080p content should be at a higher bit rate because the pixels are individually more important and so should be stored with more, more fidelity than the 4K content, but that's not normally what happens. And in the best case scenario, you're, most cases you're talking about a four times difference between 4K and 1080p in terms of storage or bit rate. Now this is potentially important that storage space savings, it's the primary reason that I shoot in 1080p, although again, consider your subject matter and what you're doing. These videos are not fine dramatic pieces. Uh, I don't think I'm Steven Spielberg or even close, and this is not a Hollywood blockbuster. It's a talking a guy talking about resolution for cameras. And the short of it is, is this video would not be any better if I shot it in 8K or 4K, but it would take four or 16 times as much space for me to store it. And space, even though it's massively cheaper now, and I'm glad I'm not shooting on film because that would be ridiculous, uh, space still costs money. And this is still a small YouTube channel that can't afford Linus Tech Tips sized petabyte storage servers to shoot everything in obscenely high resolutions that really aren't making a 
difference for the content. Which isn't to say I don't shoot in 4K or 8K, which brings me to talking about 8K. 8K has its uses, as does 4K. And as I said, 4K is just a pretty safe resolution to shoot at across the board, just as is. 8K has its, or its, its uses. If the content that you are shooting is predominantly driven by the picture that you are presenting. Uh, so there's plenty of YouTube channels that are basically relaxing music with uh, mountain views or walks through cities or something like that. The content is almost entirely the picture, uh, picture, unless you're listening to the music. In which case, having all of the image quality that you possibly can get when you're shooting it is certainly where I would put my focus. 8K is also incredibly useful if, like me, you're a still photographer to a certain extent, even though I've shot more video in the last three years than I've shot stills, uh, if you still think of yourself that way and you're trying to shoot video with the intent of being able to frame grab and make stills from that. So if you're shooting it 4K, you only have 8 to 8.3 megapixels or somewhere in that range, around 8 megapixels to work with, which, yes, you can make prints from 8 megapixels, but that's very much on the low end of the, the limits from that. I've certainly made prints from less than that. If the image is compelling, it works, but you don't have a lot of margin. On the other hand, 8K gives you 33 to 35 megapixels to work with, whether you're shooting in DCI, UHD or DCI formats. If you crop that to a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, which would be what you would be shooting stills in, that comes down to 28 megapixels if you're not changing from landscape to portrait, or 12 megapixels if you are changing from landscape to portrait. It's a loss. Uh, it's certainly not as good as shooting 45 megapixel stills, but 28 megapixels is entirely useful for making prints uh, that look good pretty much in all situations. And barring, in fact, barring some very high resolution, very fine grained, very low ASA black and white films, 28 megapixels puts you above what most, if not all, color film stocks would be able to reproduce in 135 format. 12 megapixels is, of course, much worse or less, uh, but it's still something to work with, and it's still more information that you're getting in a portrait cropped out of the center of a landscape video shot at 8K than you would have shooting a portrait video in 4K at full resolution. So, not a bad deal. Now, of course, the problem with 8K is storage. However, if you are either primarily focused on maximum image quality because that's what your content is then you plan and make you make you budget for the storage requirements because that's what the situation dictates otherwise if you're like me it's something that you shoot occasionally and the when it's necessary or useful and therefore you don't end up like yeah it's big but you don't end up with the situation of like Every talking head video that I'm producing is not being shot in 8K because it, it's not warranted and the storage requirements would be so obscene that it just doesn't make any sense to do and why waste my disk space, my money, my bandwidth, etc. for content that is never going to be useful like that. So I hope this is at least useful, uh, if not interesting, because I think sometimes, at least, I've had this happen to me, we get caught up in more, 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 and we don't necessarily think about what is actually required and what we need to do to get up to that. So I hope that this walked through well a discussion from first principles of a human vision all the way to what you need to actually be shooting at for your content to be good enough to not have to be something that you need to worry about. So if you did find this useful or at least informative, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.